You are listening to True Crime Twins, a true crime podcast hosted by Chloe and Melina Cantor. True Crime Twins is produced by Crawlspace Media. Welcome back to True Crime Twins. I'm Chloe. And I'm Melina. Thanks for listening. How's it going, Chloe? I am great on this lovely weekend. We're having some tumultuous weather. The sun is out, but then it will start snowing. Late February is an interesting time. Yeah, all I know is that I'm looking forward to some summertime being outside, swimming. I miss it. Enough with the winter. Me too. And what's on your mind as far as true crime? Yeah, enough of the weather, small talk. Um, Well, in terms of true crime... I am kind of obsessed with the situation going on with the doomsday mom, Lori Vallow. Oh, yes. She's all over the news. It's really peculiar and like nothing I've ever like heard of before. I've never seen a case like this before ever. Um, This woman was arrested in Hawaii for several charges, including desertion. Mm -hmm. She has two kids. One of them is um, name is TJ. And the other one is name is Tylee. And his name they, is Joshua. He goes by TJ. Sorry, I, he goes by JJ. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> J, okay, so JJ is seven. Tylee is seventeen. Mm-hmm. So both of them are completely unaccounted for. Their mother Lori Vallow married a man named Chad Daybell, and they moved to Hawaii. Right. So both of these kids were last seen like several months ago. I think as much as four months ago in Idaho. And kind of this weird um, series of events had been going on. Like, Lori has been married multiple times. Her brother had assaulted one of her previous husbands and just murdered her most recent husband before um, Daybell. And now her brother is dead and people don't know why. And Lori's new husband, the one that she went to Hawaii with chad daybell his wife just mysteriously died too and then they got married a few weeks later yes so between the two of them they have three dead spouses um all of whom were relatively young at the time of their deaths it's really suspicious and now all of a sudden she doesn't have these kids to worry about and she's living her best life with her new husband in hawaii yes speaking of warm weather you know ditching idaho for hawaii so where are her kids what happened um, I think that she told somebody that um, hadn't known the kids before. She told somebody that was like new in her life that her daughter had been dead for years, which is obviously like, uh, uh-uh, like horrible sign. Not good that she's saying that. Yeah, heavily implies guilt or knowledge. Yeah. Um, but something that's important to note here is that um, Lori was a fan of her new husband's books, which were about um, like the next life. Like he claimed to have... Um, like a spiritual connection and he claimed that doomsday was coming this summer and i think that she became like one of his disciples and it said that they're sort of a part of this kind of scary religious cult so it's possible that in that delusional mindset that maybe she did something to her kids to like spare them or something i don't know but she's not talking to bring them to the next level that her husband was describing it'll be interesting to hear what her explanation is she hasn't spoken out publicly since her arrest she hasn't been charged with anything um like kidnapping murder no- nothing nothing like that Not even like negligence right Just, so well, i guess d- desertion so at this point um you know they're not they're not prepared to make that arrest i guess but hopefully their investigation will uncover a little bit more in this really strange mystery yeah she is currently on five million bail and she has waived her extradition treaty and she is going to be returning to idaho to answer for these charges quite soon speaking of moms there's another case that's uh pretty widespread in the media right now the disappearance of evelyn boswell she was last seen the day after christmas by her grandparents her 18 year old mother did not report her missing how old's evelyn evelyn is 15 months old and how old's the mom 18 years old 18 years old okay so baby's missing mom didn't report her missing wow correct okay so i believe she i know that she is in police custody she was arrested i'm not sure what the exact charge was but it was related to you know making a false statement or filing a false report in the state of tennessee there is not a law for um 
not filing your child missing or failing to file your child missing. There wasn't one in Florida either until Kaylee. Right. So now they're, I think, proposing Evelyn's law. So another really disconcerting case, the mother, Megan Boswell, claimed that she was currently pregnant when she was arrested, but they tested her for pregnancy in Hmm. jail and she's not. She was lying. So what a weird, obviously disprovable thing to lie about. It's the whole thing is so sad to think about, you know, a 15 month old baby missing. I again, another case where I really hope that we can get more answers and potentially gives us a glimpse into the most unthinkably horrible parts of society. Yeah, I would I'd say that's an accurate statement, like the worst of the worst. And is this woman still in jail? As far as I know, she hasn't been released. Yeah. Wow. Um, I guess this is a developing story. This is one that actually is pretty new to me. I think Chloe's been following it a little bit. Yeah, and I'll I'll continue to follow it closely because, I mean, Evelyn hasn't been found. Evelyn's grandmother and grandmother's boyfriend were arrested driving together in the car that was listed on the Amber Alert. The whole thing is just really strange. They're searching ponds. They're searching mobile homes. I just hope that answers can come soon so that whoever is responsible for this disappearance yeah can face the consequences because it's obviously an unthinkable crime so yeah. um, so enough about these deplorable moms that make me really sad to talk about <laughs> yeah all this makes me sad to talk about but that in particular yeah, yeah not not great no um so yeah uh, we're gonna stay tuned for more developments on both of those cases today we are focusing on the unsolved disappearance of 20 year old lauren spearer So Lauren, back in 2011, was a college student at Indiana University. She was studying textiles, I think, textiles design, something having to do with fashion. Mm -hmm. She was a really, really uh, social girl, a lot of fun, very well liked. She was particularly known for her tiny stature. She was like, I don't think even five feet tall. Nope, she was Uh, Not even 100 pounds. Nope. So uh, kind of like a very petite, full of life type of person. (laughs) Yeah. Very energetic personality, bubbly. I think I remember seeing descriptions that she was really into like hippie stuff, like peace and love kind of thing. She was remembered as a very loving friend. One of her friends had told a story that after she had a difficult breakup, Lauren had sent her a care package. Um, One of the items was tissues and a note was... No crying over boys just because you miss me. So she's that's so sweet, right? Wouldn't that make you laugh? Yeah, that made me yes. laugh. I actually didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, that's cute. yeah, very cute. So a, a sweet girl. She grew up in Westchester County, New York, graduating high school in 2009. She had a health condition that um, you know will become a more important point of discussion as we continue to talk about her case. But when she was just a baby. Lauren was diagnosed with long QT syndrome, which is a heart condition that required daily medication and some lifestyle changes. Um, can you tell me about sure. long t- QT syndrome, Melina, as the uh, nursing student? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm not Stick not by any, I know not by any means um, calling myself an expert, but my basic understanding is that I don't know if anybody's ever seen like an EKG and what like the um, the heart look the heartbeat looks like it's like lines going up like yeah, a the, mountain the waves yes yeah, the waves so um long qt syndrome refers to that the um the segment between the q and the t um it's a electrical conduct electrical conduction issue so if she were to overexert herself or do anything else that would sort of make her heart race or make her heart in danger of racing then she could have arrhythmias which could cause heart failure so this or was at the very least fainting. And I think people who have heart conditions, they know that when you have something like this, it's kind of in the back of your head a lot. You need to consider it when you're making a lot of choices. She had to stop playing sports in high school. Like it's she had to make sacrifices for it. Right. And, um, you know, she was a 20 year old college student who did use and probably misuse substances like yeah. like alcohol and cocaine and other drugs so that was probably something that she shouldn't have been doing because of that heart issue yeah um i get i get you know kind of resenting having this condition that you didn't ask for and maybe rebel against it a little bit obviously it's not very smart but maybe that's no. why and people you know even though she's 20 
she's she's basically still a teenager. Yeah, they don't, in my eyes, yeah. They don't have that prefrontal cortex development where um, consequences are clearly foreseen. And like you said, that there's more impulsivity. She wants to be like every other college kid mm-hmm. and not want to be held back by it. But on the night of her disappearance, she certainly misused substances to the point where her her behavior, her her verbiage, her the way physical her, movements her physical movements were severely impaired and you have to think about how that might have affected her heart affected her heart so so she disappeared on the early morning hours of june 3rd 2011 so what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the circumstances of that night what she was doing who she was with so lauren had a boyfriend named jesse wolf who was like back at her hometown like they were together for a really long time but he was not there he was apparently at home playing video games during this time, but I'm just mentioning that she had a boyfriend. So do we know why he didn't want to go out that night? I don't... It's kind of unclear. They were... I think they were, like, texting and stuff. I think that he maybe just was tired or wasn't in the mood. Like, sometimes I'm not in the mood to go out. Well, me neither. Most of the time. But was <laughs> yeah. he was he alone? Like, to, No, I think he was um with, like, a college roommate. So he's alibied, yeah, essentially, he's, is what he's I'm getting never at. Been, um, he's never been looked at. But I'm, I'm just mentioning just because people, like, she was hanging out with a bunch of guys that night. So people think that that's weird. So Jesse was her long-term boyfriend. She had met him at Jewish summer camp. Mm-hmm. She had spent many years going to that camp and her circle of friends. Many of them attended camp with her. So very tight inner circle. His mother, um, his being Jesse Wolf, had commented after Lauren's disappearance that that girl caused her own disappearance because of her abuse of substances and i think had also made the comment that lauren was kicked out of summer camp because of ongoing substance abuse yeah like I don't, e- even if that's true like i feel like that that was kind of unnecessary for her to say why on earth would yeah, she say that i don't know maybe maybe people were like talking smack about her right son. she got defensive she was frustrated by by that inf- misinformation but there's no reason to smear a missing person yeah e- even if it's in the defense of your son like and even if drugs were the reason why she disappeared or had a role in it there's really no reason to bring up her getting kicked out of summer camp but honestly if if i had no reason to be guilty i mean to be guilty to be suspicious of jesse wolf that would make me a little bit suspicious her saying that because it's like why are you mm-hmm. Why are you being so overly defensive to the point of being nasty about all someone who them, can't defend themselves? All of the key players of that night were very, very defensive, <laughs> like immediately. But anyway, so, yeah, so let's let's break it down a little more. So uh, this is taking place in Bloomington, Indiana. Lauren lived in an off campus apartment called Smallwood Plaza. She met up with her friend Corey Rossman and they, I think, were drinking and I think he said that maybe she had crushed up something and snorted it before this, they went out. This, Yeah. So she the night started um, at her apartment with a friend named David. And then they walked to um, Jay's house and Corey lived in the next apartment. So Jay is a friend from her past. But Corey is somebody that apparently she had just met that night. But they walked. But her and her friend walked to that different apartment complex and okay. they were partying there. So they were using substances and then Lauren and Corey, who, as Melina just said, had just met, the two went off on their own to go to a bar. Where Called Kilroy's. Kilroy's Sports Bar. They were having a beach night, so there was sand on the floor. And they were most likely heavily drinking before they left, but when they're there, they're like pounding down drinks and being all sloppy and so sloppy, in fact, that she left her phone and her shoes when right. they left. Right. She had taken her shoes off originally because of the sand on the floor, but she was so impaired that she didn't collect her belongings before leaving. Their movements were actually captured on some surveillance uh, footage just on the way back. And you could see that Lauren is heavily impaired by the way that she's moving. Mm-hmm. I believe that Corey even carries her at some point. He does. So around 2.30, they leave the bar and they're walking back to Lauren's apartment. And keep in mind that all of this... It's very, um, they're, everything's kind of close together in this area. You can walk most places. So all of the traveling that they're doing is walking. So Corey and Lauren leave the bar and they walk to her house for an unknown reason. I think that maybe she was getting something or whatever. But um, Witness saw them walking and noted that she was very, very intoxicated. And she um, 
when they get into her apartment, some guys like noticed how drunk she was and said something to Corey being like, like I think along the lines of like, how, how could you let her get this way? Like, she, like what's wrong with you? Why is, she, you know, cause I think it looked really bad. And to clarify, this wasn't in her actual apartment unit. This was in the lobby Ooh, or, or the like, hallway or a public area. So a confrontation ensues. There's been a lot of different accounts on exactly what was said. I've also heard that this guy said, uh, just simply, are you okay to Lauren? And that Corey was very dismissive and said kind of like, I got it. I got or it. Or like rude or, or like made a smart comment. Yeah, made a, made a snarky comment. And then Corey ends up getting punched by this guy in the Hard. face. Yeah. Falls to the ground. I think Lauren helps him back up. And they leave. And they leave. So when they're walking from her apartment to Corey's apartment um they're walking together Lauren loses her keys and sh- so he's basically like probably concussed and he's wasted and she's so wasted that she's dropping all her stuff he has to carry her in like a fireman's um carry like over his shoulder because she just keeps falling and she's falling directly and- on her face because she doesn't have like the reaction time to like put her elbows out Right, when you're that impaired, your reflexes um, to brace your fall by putting your hands in front of you, um, it, it doesn't happen. So she had hit her head and her face, I think, more than two times in a very short period of time. Yes. So they arrive at Corey's apartment at 2.51, and there's really no way to say what really happened in that apartment. All we can go on is what the people who were there said. So according to Corey's roommate... Michael Beth, he, Corey was like vomiting and trashed. So Michael Beth helped put him to bed and Lauren was awake and he was like, what's that bruise on your face? And she was like, I don't know. Like she, she didn't even know why she had a bruised face. You'd think you'd remember, you know, slamming your face to the ground. She, I I think was blackout and I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert on um, this subject, but I've heard that that's more likely to happen if you're like mixing things mixing liquor and substances yeah I, i'm any pretty, kind of substance really i'm pretty sure that Corey said that lauren had crushed up something like a painkiller or, or some prescription medication and snorted it that night and he like didn't know what it was he was just like oh yeah she did she snorted something and i didn't ask what it was no he might have said what it was specifically and i'm just not remembering okay so blame me know. for blame me for that one no but i don't know maybe that maybe that's what happened but anyway um so lauren's still awake Corey's apparently passed out in bed and she's trying to get Michael Beth to like keep drinking with her. She like she's like, yeah, let's go to my let's go to my apartment party. And he's like, you should just like sleep here. Right. He was not interested in um, her invitations at all. Um, According to him, he was rebuffing her. She seemed to lack insight that she had already had way too much to drink and was trying to continue. He was just trying to kind of go get, get, go to bed get her get her out of his place 3 a.m so in order to get her out kind of like out of his hair he calls jay who we mentioned before jay and Corey are neighbors in the same building and jay is a friend of lauren's from a few years back yeah she knew him for, i think from the same co- summer camp where she met her boyfriend michael calls jay and jay is sort of retrieves lauren takes him back to to his place and she apparently left after that and he was the last person to who was known to see her alive. He said that he watched her walk down the street away from his apartment towards her apartment. And she was never seen again. So she was not captured on any CCTV on this alleged path home, was she? No. And if she was, then like they don't really release much anyway. Like the only thing, the only image that we have is like, her walking in her apartment building like right showing what she was last seen wearing all of the other references that we've made are based on descriptions by law enforcement um those haven't actually been released but that's the official timeline so this is just um what we know is that jay rosenbaum was the last person to admit to seeing lauren that night Mm -hmm. and all we really have is their account to go off of and we don't know if it's honest they really clammed up once this case was being investigated, I don't all know. All got lawyers. Yeah, they all got lawyers immediately, which a lot of people, I mean, especially Lauren's family, found very suspicious. They were not cooperative with the family. The family actually ended up suing them. They uh, accused these men of... Negligence. Of negligence in that they failed to provide care 
for Lauren when she needed it, which potentially resulted in her death. Like they didn't straight up accuse them of murder or of a cover up. But they were trying They were to- saying that you admitted to letting her go that night and you had an obligation to make sure she was safe and you didn't. And I think that they even admitted that the purpose of that lawsuit was to compel the men to speak more. Yeah. But it didn't work. And they it was thrown out. It was thrown out. The judge was I, like, they had no duty to care for her. She's an adult. But like, I don't know. Maybe there was like another way to get them punished for that. Because that's that's like a crime against humanity, in my opinion. She had no phone, no shoes, no keys, no wallet. And you're going to... Like, come on, like, was she that hard to stop to walk home? Like, obviously, you can't, like, hold her against her will, but you could have gone with her, for God's sake. And he says, I think, that she insisted that she did, that she wanted to walk alone. I think Even though she just invited somebody else to come Right, he claims her. that he offered to walk her home. So that's that's a little bit strange. Yeah, certainly not, um, not very wise of him to do that, or at least call somebody. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure the legal definition is different from this moral um subjective discussion that we're having but i feel like people that she had just met that night like mike beth and Corey, Corey, i don't think that they really had a duty of care to her so much she kind of went into their space yeah um they had nothing to do with her or they never met her before but i think jay rosenbaum was an old friend of hers and like friends with her boyfriend friends with her boyfriend like she had connections with him i morally like i said not legally morally i i, I, I yeah, do crime think, against humanity yeah I, I do think he he should have done he, something. he should have done more to protect her if that's what happened so if, if she if she really did walk away from that building that night by herself so this is kind of where we can start discussing theories so a uh, common theory is that lauren did not walk out of that apartment building on her own a lot of people think that something happened with this inner circle of men either intentionally or not and that they disposed of lauren's remains and made up this cover-up story and that's why they clammed up that's why they've been so defensive lawyered up uncooperative so that's an ongoing theory i i'd like to know if any of them had access to vehicle at the time i don't know I think that a lot of college students don't, but also a lot of college students like know somebody that does could at least borrow a car. Right. And I just don't. And also like, I don't know. I don't want to be graphic here, but she's very little. I don't know if they could have just like carried her somewhere nearby. She was 90 pounds, according to her missing persons flyer. I mean, 90 pounds of dead weight is still extremely heavy i don't think that it would have been as easy as tossing her over the shoulder like Corey had done earlier that night i think when it's completely dead i i don't think it i don't think it would have been easy is what i'm saying but i i a lot of people will say oh well these guys weren't sophisticated criminals how did they pull off the disposal how is she still not found and i don't think you have to be a criminal mastermind to successfully conceal a body i agree yeah if you uh if you find a remote location where people don't really go, then kind of time does the work for you. Exactly. So I'm inclined to sort of believe that. I think it's the most simple explanation. I think it is. The there's some simple. there's some strange contradictions with the stories of the men. I mean, I find it really, really odd that, you know, Corey, who was spending time with Lauren alone that night, you know, the two went out together, just the two of them. You know, that's not always something that people do when they're in a long-term serious relationship. Kind of go out partying with other men, especially one-on-one. Yeah, like, I'm I'm thinking about it and, like, even in, like, trusting relationships that I've been in. Me, personally, I didn't have a desire to, like, go out with, like, (laughs) a guy without my boyfriend. (laughs) But that's what she's not me. I don't know. No, everyone's different, but I could see it being like a group dynamic but just the two of them i i don't know it just kind they of went out after they were already partying just the two of them yeah and then they went back to her place together for some reason and then they came back to his place right so that's a lot of time together so it makes me wonder if there was um one-sided or possibly mutual romantic feelings or sexual feelings and then according to mike beth uh you know Corey throws out. up and passes out that night which sort of clears him of any wrongdoing but there's really no proof of that Corey says that because he was punched in the head 
that night he didn't remember any of the events after getting punched convenient which is exactly what lauren's dad said so i feel like if anyone may have harmed her it was out of those men it would probably be the one that demonstrated potential sexual interest in her and like was being spending confrontational and rude to strangers and like right, he was in a nasty mood that he, night and he was kind of acting sort of possessive of her i think i think that's probably why those people had a problem with him right he, he was acting in a way that rubbed them the wrong way and they were concerned about lauren and, and he hasn't talked to the parents he's the only one apparently who hasn't who, why not i don't know i'm trying to think if i were in that position like let's say he's totally innocent of everything and um you're being accused people are people like us are talking about him and questioning his innocence or guilt why wouldn't i want to talk to her family i don't know yeah i just is there a reason i think it's possible that it wasn't this group act like i I don't think that all these men all perpetrated some act or all even saw what happened i think that these guys could be really close friends and maybe Corey, each other. right and maybe Corey says something to mike like please tell them that i that i was passed out and that you saw me sleeping mm-hmm. or something like that and that's and that's all that mike knows that mm-hmm. Corey told him to lie he lied and now he can't go back on it because it's too late but i i do think that there are actions like the confluence of the circumstances of the way that these men behave the contradictions between the stories and everything it's just it, it doesn't add up it doesn't sit right so i'm thinking about it and i wonder why these young men if any of them had anything to do with this and covered it up about why they would do that and not call the police. And one reason could be that they're these young college students that have their whole futures ahead of them. And I think that like, they probably have a lot of pressure on them from themselves and their families to like, you know, not screw up. And even, I don't know, maybe even if it was an accident, they would think that there would be innuendo or like accusation, but I feel like that a cover-up is more likely if somebody did something wrong to right. her. If it was truly an accident, why have the guilty conscience of feeling like you need to hide it? Unless, you know, these people could all have been using illegal drugs. I know Lauren was 20. Um, I just would need to have a quick look at my notes to see exactly how old the other men were. But it's possible maybe they were all underage and were afraid of under underage drinking. I think... It, there have been situations where people have overdosed on drugs and the person that was accompanying them probably doing drugs with them is too afraid to call for help where someone could come and um, initiate life-saving measures because they're afraid of being arrested. So I do think that in some states or some areas, there are laws that um, provide immunity to people. If they call for help in those situations, they won't be arrested. Yeah, but I'm sure people don't know They that. don't know that. I didn't know they that. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I don't know if that's the case in Indiana, but I, I do think that there are a lot of situations where even if you are using legal substances, if you do call for help, they're not going to arrest you because you did the right thing. And right. They, they and don't want to discourage that. What if like what if they could just call the police and then and then lawyer it up because they're going to lawyer up anyway, right? Right. Yeah, and then they probably would have been fine. And people are talking about them anyway. Yeah, I think, I think disposing of a body... Uh, feels more guilty and intentional than observing an accidental death and you know that this is where her heart condition comes back in she's she's mixing substances she's very inebriated she's hitting her head she's falling and she has this heart uh that ticking time bomb that can't uh, handle too much stress to the point where she couldn't play dodgeball in PE. Yeah. And now she's using all these substances that uh, increase your heart rate. They do all these things to your body. I think it's it's not far-fetched that she could have had cardiac arrest that night. Not not an overdose, but cardiac arrest. But, like, obviously, like, with the, the drugs and alcohol being a contributing factor. But, like, I know, I've heard of people without heart conditions that have heart attacks and die if they do coke with something else, especially alcohol. I'm yeah. pretty sure that those two specifically are right. very dangerous. Even without that pre-existing condition. If it, you're doing a lot of both. Like, I think she was clearly drinking way too much for, like, her body size. So like, these, for anybody's body size, really. Here's a theory. So these guys, some of them are friends with her boyfriend. You know, yes. Corey has never... He, that was the first time she had met him, so I don't know if he knew... The boyfriend. She, the boyfriend or not these other guys know her boyfriend what if she hooked up with one of those guys that was friends with her boyfriend and she dies during the sex Mm. 
and Ooh. they don't want that to get out because obviously the boyfriend would find out that they were sleeping with lauren and there could be like assault allegations yes or maybe it was too- happened yes there, there's a lot of different uh potential theories as to what happened in the apartment that night i'd love to be a fly on the wall but also i kind of wouldn't want to be because something really messed up could have happened oh, something horrible probably happened yeah but i, um, I want to know what it is no, it, but i don't know if i want to see it of course you don't No, just because it's so mysterious you'd like to know <laughs> you'd like to know what i want to see i want to see it for myself kind of yeah it's yeah and a lot of people think that she did leave the apartment building like and then snatched or something yeah so like jay said she walked out and was walking on the sidewalk towards her place short walk short walk but she's out of sight and a vehicle comes by and either forcefully um she's abducted or they lure her somehow with we know because she's less um she's prone she's prone to suggestion right state and i think that if she let's say just had a heart attack and died on the street somebody wouldn't just like dispose of her body Why? yeah you know? so, like, that's not what happened you know no. if, she, if she died in her dorm if she died anywhere that's like a public place then people have no reason to try to hide it yeah i think i think most likely it was one of it was one of those guys and they didn't necessarily murder her but they're hiding something else like uh, illegal drug use or having sex with her or or, or maybe, it, or it could have been intentional. I don't know, but I don't know really where the case can go from here. Yeah, there, I really hope there's there are things going on behind the scenes because I agree with Lauren's parents that I feel that a lot of answers could be gleaned from these men. I agree, but they're not cooperating. I mean, there was a random abduction case in Bloomington that actually. Um, started at the same bar that Lauren last went to, Kilroy's. And this was after her disappearance, right? Yes. And that case was actually solved. Um, The woman's name was Hannah Wilson. She went into a vehicle of a man named Daniel Messel, thinking that he was her Uber driver. And he ended up um, abducting and killing her. I don't think that's what happened. I think that... um, I, I remember thinking that that's what happened at first, but I read that she did take an Uber home or a cab home, and that guy followed her in the cab and then she w- like went outside of her house for some reason and then he snatched her so i remember when this story first came out that it was reported that she got into the wrong car because it was a whole uber i think that at the time there was like uber scandals and there were a lot of cases where someone got into a car thinking that it was an uber and the guy like went along with it or something right but that's not what happened she made it home safely with the um cab that she took home and this guy followed her and she for whatever reason came out of her house and ended up in his truck and we don't really know what happened but she ended up being dead and found in a field with the killer's phone which is how they were i know oh my (laughs) god so they also um found claw marks on his arms and blood and hair in his vehicle so of course especially because you know she's picked up from kilroy's where lauren went that night people thought could have could it have been daniel that abducted her that night and was he ruled out i think he i don't think that he's being looked at for that reason i'm sure that they've investigated him but they've never named him as a person of interest Mm -hmm. and they haven't named anyone as a person of interest and I think that this is a seedy area. Like, I, I know that we're just talking about one abduction and murder here, but I know that there were others in that area. I think that that any college area kind of will attract some seedy people because there's a bunch of, like, drunk girls walking around. Yeah, it's... yeah. Any college town like that, any, like, area where college students will congregate and party people will kind of show up like hey let's party (laughs) right Uh, and especially creepy people that want to take advantage of young vulnerable people so according to the state police sergeant dunhill um in the state of indiana there is nothing at this time to suggest that daniel messel is connected to lauren's disappearance so he hasn't been cleared he hasn't been ruled out but they don't have evidence to connect it so that's kind of where that stands. It doesn't so mean those aren't necessarily connected. No, and someone else could have abducted her. Mm-hmm. I just think if she really did walk out of that apartment with no phone, shoes, wallet, or keys, <laughs> how has she even gone to her apartment? Maybe there is a way. You know, people have ways of getting to their place without keys. But like, I don't think she could have put keys into a door. 
No, no, you're right. She could probably barely open the door. I remember when I was still in college, you and I went to go get brunch together and there was like a bottomless mimosa thing. Oh, and I don't really drink that much at all, but I was like feeling festive. You were visiting me. It was fun. I remember we went back to my off-campus apartment and I was having trouble putting the key in the door. Mm-hmm. And that was maybe after two things. So like she... Your your gross and fine motor skills are highly impaired when you're as drunk as she was. And, and she, she even as drunk as you were, which could, wasn't that drunk. No, I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it, 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 that's different than not being able to break your own fall. So the fact that she wasn't even able to break a fall, barely walk, barely walk. I really, I, I think the the chances are very slim that she was able to safely make it anywhere on foot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like I said, if she passed out, fainted drop dead or just got like injured on the street then this wouldn't we wouldn't be talking about this you know if she didn't make it home for some other reason besides um something happening at that place or her being snatched elsewhere so melina is it sounds like we sort of agree that it something happened in that apartment building and that she never left that's my feeling and facing towards anyone (sighs) i know that it's like (laughs) speculative to like base it off of like their pictures like the guy stop yeah so i'm, I'm not do, gonna- do you just want to stop that thought immediately yeah <laughs> like they have evil eyes so I think they did it. but like jay's is the last one who said that he saw her and uh, i'm between jay and Corey, or both of them knowing something and if Corey knows something then michael beth probably knows something yeah i think they all have information i'm i'm between jay and Corey as far as the The aggravating factors here yes yep and i think the death was most likely an accident but something else was going on that they didn't want people to know about and that in itself makes it foul play so i want people to have a line to call if they have information about lauren's disappearance the investigating agency is indiana state police the tip line for any information is 812 339-4477. Again, that is 812-339-4477 or email helpfindlauren at gmail.com.